All right, we are live. Welcome to Romance Happy Hour. <laughs> Yay. Another Thursday night, and we have Dawn back with us tonight. Yay. I am. And it's actually earlier. You you drove past me. You, you yeah. used an hour ahead of me, and then you drove past me without stopping, I might add. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. The other side of me, and you're an hour behind me. Yeah, we were going to go south, hit up a Bucky's. Mm -hmm. but we had to truck it here and we barely made it in time to close on our house. So we didn't went right through the middle and just sliced our way up. But uh, yeah, yeah. I forgive you. You're closer to me. I think maybe by an hour or two now, not, oh. not much. Yeah. Yeah. Are you both CST now? No, I'm mm -hmm. on, I'm mountain standard time now. All oh, right. I get so confused by the ST and the MS. I get very yeah. confused. No, yeah. Dawn, Dawn moved from Eastern Standard to, well, Eastern, whatever, Eastern to Mountain. Um, and I'm Central, so she just went right past me. And, uh, <laughs> what's the difference between Mountain and Central? Um, an hour. An hour. Oh, okay. yes. An hour and a half. I'm an hour and a half of her now. Oh, okay. And now, instead of me having to stay up late, I could be, I could, like, when you guys get off, I can sit here and talk to Dylan and, <laughs> and make her stay up later now. And I'm just like, what? It's only like eight o'clock my time now. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's three. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I know. Anyway, I, yes. I can't even believe that, that you, I had no idea that you were joining us from Spain. So that brings yeah. us to, we are here tonight. Dawn is back and we are here with two international yeah. authors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah two international authors at the same time, Don? Not at the same time, no. We've had one from Brazil, one from Australia, anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Canada, I mean, you know, we have can Canadians. More Canadians, yeah. I think, than anywhere else. Probably. I think we've yeah, had a We're not that exotic. <laughs> <laughs> you have kind of three things going on as well, because like I'm a Brit, but I'm in Spain. So you're like yeah. all of the borders. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So we're very excited to have Deborah Wild and Serena Aykroyd joining us tonight. So welcome. And Dawn, we're happy to have you back. So you just said that the movers came yes. yesterday and the day before. So are you still living with boxes? Are you all settled in and unpacked now? I honestly wish at this point I could like reverse screen because I'm staring at a stack almost to the ceiling of boxes. So yeah, I do have my furniture and that's, that's key, you mm -hmm. know? And I think I've, I'm like half a box from unpacking my entire kitchen. So. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. For sure. It always, it always fascinates me in America, like how you guys move so fast. Like <laughs> you say, okay, I'm going to sell a house. And then like a week later, sold your house and you bought the next one and you're moving in the week after oh like, okay it could take six to eight months wow. and like i know people who've just like i'm moving and then they're just in a new house i think it's, it's fascinating i love it it's awesome that's awesome <laughs> fast <laughs> no hanging around <laughs> yeah yeah well we're uh i'm excited to be here i'm happy for oh. sure we had um i think a week of being in here without our, our stuff and then it showed up and I'm happy about that because I was needing my computer. Well, I had my computer, but I needed a couch to sit on and this bed to sit on so that I wasn't like, you know, sitting in a camp chair doing romance happy hour. <laughs> to me, Montana is like Diana Palmer cowboy country. Yes. Yes. Very much. And like, so, I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Yellowstone and I probably shouldn't um, divulge this information because my town is 700 people, but I, I am currently living in the town that Yellowstone is filmed in oh. and it's, it's so small town, but it's a cowboy town. Like our downtown area looks like a wild west town and oh. I'm our marshal. So the marshal has been like driving past my house like two and three times a day. And he like slows down and stares. And I think it's because we're the only new house in town since in like a decade. And um, so uh, he like slows down and stares and I'm thinking, does he think we're criminals? Cause we're not. Well, I just found out this morning as I was driving my kids to school that the marshal actually works out of uh, one of those, 
faced buildings like those old western buildings that says marshall on top and i thought it was just like a tourist trap thing but it's actually his office and i'm like that's awesome so <laughs> what is a marshall i thought like u.s marshals were the kind of guys mm -hmm. that yeah get, stuff like that it's yeah that he's he's a u.s marshal so basically it's just jurisdiction so they have like the city cops the marshals the um the state troopers uh, there's just different different police officers for different jurisdictions so you have a lot of police for a very small town <laughs> yeah we do we also have a state job. trooper very yeah right now <laughs> yeah super wild safe. west Serena. yeah the wild yeah. west yes <laughs> i mean it, it's so wild my neighbors said um oh just so you know like our dog attacked a moose the other day because it was in our yard so i'm <laughs> i'm waiting for the moose to come around oh but God. we'll see they're dangerous yeah, mm -hmm. yeah they are they're yeah. super dangerous yeah thank you I made my kids listen to Hatchet on the way home. We got like books on tape and, and they would always be like, no, not another book on tape. But then we'd get into it and the, the car was silent every time we listened to the book on tape. So I put it on when I was tired of hearing my kids talking <laughs> That's what and, and oh. <laughs> they're just riveted. And now I say moose and they're like, no, not a moose. <laughs> I have never seen a moose. I have never seen. I think the most exotic it gets here is cats. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I, yeah. saw, I saw a snake once. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the, the bulls in Spain. Yeah, running of the bulls. Yeah, they're kind of all like in a. They're all corralled, but corral. Sorry, they're all corralled, and you don't sort yeah. of see them unless you decide to run with them and be crazy right. and kind of like get bored. So you can't there's not enough them. money in the world you could pay. Me. I would be the first one trampled. Like I, <laughs> right off the bat. Yeah. Well, a lot of people get trampled, and it's just it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Like, if you go to Barcelona area, they don't have it because okay. quite rightly they don't agree with it. And then uh, in my town, they have it, and every year there's somebody who gets gored, and you're just like, well, what do you expect when you go to a stampede of bulls? Like right. anywhere else. You know, but hey, each to their own. <laughs> I was yeah. in Toledo and they were airing bullfighting bullfights on the television set. And they did a whole profile, this lovely profile of the bull, and her name was Daisy. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Oh, go Daisy. And then everyone got really offended at me that I was like cheering for the bull. But it's like you just did this whole like multimedia profile on the bull. Like, how do you really <laughs> not root for it now? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, you're kind of supposed to, you know, root for the, you know, Toriado. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I got <laughs> snuckered by the media. So. They're, like, they're, they're celebrities, you know. They're proper, proper famous here. It's very strange. It's very strange. <laughs> I did a rodeo um, when I in high school. I was in the rodeo association, and then um, I think it was I think it was Hamilton. I want to be honest. It may have been French Town nearby, but uh, we, during the event, the announcer announced that a bull got loose, and it was now running through Main Street. So I don't think that they those people were prepared. No, enough no, for no. Daisy the bull to come no. running through. Ever are though, like even when they're prepared, it's they're, they're always really shocked. Like they get through these rails, they put these rails there that a kid could knock over, and they're super shocked. When they <laughs> yeah, can knock it. It's it's absolutely insane. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> I'd love to go to a rodeo though. I've seen those, and I've read about so many because yeah. like, cowboy romance and all that jazz. And yeah. Like, when you said rodeo, I was like, oh, I know these words. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, from a book. Okay, well, if you ever come to Montana, just look me up and I'll I'll take you all over the place. So, yeah. Diana Palmer. Well, yes. Well, would you like to introduce yourselves since we've been sitting here talking and, and we haven't let you introduce yourselves yet? So, Serena, would you like to tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you write and, and where you're joining us from. Cause it's amazing that you're actually awake and coherent enough to talk to us right now. <laughs> yeah. it's Yeah. Like I say, it's 3am here. I'm in Spain. I'm in the South, um, well, uh, Southeast Spain um, near Valencia. And I am a Brit, as you can obviously tell from my accent, but I write romance that is based mostly in the U S it's kind of uh, at the moment I'm writing mafia and MC romance, and today is actually my release day, so it's even oh, crazy. Happy that release I'm day! <laughs> it has been an absolute crazy, crazy, crazy day, and uh, that's actually what I'll be reading from today. Is the um, the book that released today? It's called The Don, and uh, the giveaway that I'm holding uh, is for 
the Don in paperback and as well the second book in the duet, uh, The Lady. Yeah, so I um, I sort of fell into this genre quite by accident and I just I just love it. Maybe, like I say, it's from all the, the, the original days of the violence of the cowboy romances and now it's just in the big cities. <laughs> but yeah, so that's me. <laughs> Great, we're really glad to have you with us. And yeah, lots of people are saying happy release day in the comments. Thank you, so. thank you. <laughs> And Deborah. Um, yes, I'm Deborah Wild, and I am joining you from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I actually started off as a screenwriter, and then I jumped ship after about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years to start writing urban fantasy, uh, which I sort of combined with my love of sexy romance. Uh, so I write funny, sexy urban fantasy, and I center it on Jewish protagonists, and I explore Jewish mythology um, and world building with it, because when I was a kid, I was, you know, I'm sure like a lot of you, I was a really avid reader, but I never saw myself in stories unless they were Holocaust stories. And those are very important stories, but I wanted to go through a wardrobe, you know, into a magic world. I wanted to ride a house in a tornado. So I was like, nope, I'm writing this for adults and we'll see who wants to come along. So I've been very lucky people have wanted to come along. Um, but this year I transitioned from urban fantasy with protagonists in their 20s to essentially urban fantasy with a protagonist in her 40s, uh, joining the paranormal women's fiction genre, which I love because that's what I wanted to write from the beginning, but I didn't think anyone wanted to read about a woman in her 40s. Uh, and yeah, so I will be reading to you tonight from book one of my PWF series. Um, the book is called Throwing Shade and my giveaway is two Kindle copies of it. Great. Yeah, and we're very excited because actually we had a last minute cancellation and Deborah was able to step in and it's great timing because that is one of the paperbacks um, that's in our Romance Happy Hour book box this month. So Yes, yes. So I happen to have several <laughs> several of those books right now. Oh, so I'm sure you do. <laughs> are ready to go into boxes as soon as I, I get the rest of the stuff. So Now, Dylan... Mm -hmm. Are they still available for sale or, or mm -hmm. is it? Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, there are, we're not quite sold out there. Um, I, I have orders open through the 28th, which is Saturday. So okay. end of the day on Saturday, if you would still like to get one. Um, yeah. And so yeah. quickly, quickly, cause then you can read Deborah's <laughs> book. <laughs> yep. So, um, and those are over at bookboxbabe.com. Yep. So, well, we are, ready to get started. I think we're, we're going to have Serena go first because you do, even though it looks like bright and sunny, though it's the middle of the night there, you have a storm rolling in. <laughs> it's and a storm. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, so we want to make sure we don't lose you. No, yeah. By the end of this, but it's like, like, I feel as if I'm in the sun. My cheeks are so warm. <laughs> it looks like it's the sun. <laughs> it looks like it's the middle of the day there, yeah, right? It does. Oh, really? No, no, I probably, mm -hmm. I'm not like um, catfishing you. <laughs> <laughs> She's really in Australia. She's not. <laughs> That's it. Can you tell by the accent? It just changes all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I actually will be, is it okay to read now? Yes. Fabulous. Yes. You um, need to set up the scene at all? Or are you starting in at page one? Or what do we need to know? It's kind of like chapter two ish i'm going to be reading from the don's point of view so i always i tend to pick really strange well it's not to me strange names as you know character names but he's called lucia he is a sicilian mobster but um he has a vendetta he, he he came into the life because he has a vendetta as his father was murdered and um he is trying to become the the boss of you know the italian the italian boss of uh, new york of new york city and then his lady um is an irish uh is an irish american she um has no technically no affiliations to any factions in the city and basically he wants her so <laughs> this is uh, pretty early on in the story it's kind of short because as i as i explained before there is my, my books have uh, nothing is gratuitous i don't want to say that because it isn't gratuitous like everything goes with the flow of the story but obviously let's keep it pg-13 so as i say it'll be very short <laughs> so um <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> All right, we will leave you to it and we will be back when you're done. Fabulous, thank you. So, uh, right, okay, so um, I won't be able to make it. See you in court, Damien Headley. 
the ex, it had to be. A ridiculous wave of jealousy unfurled inside me, one that was unnecessary, but one I couldn't help. I leaned into her, close enough that I could smell her heady perfume, so that it was pretty much all I breathed in, and asked her, do you like dancing? You can't dance here. My lips curved at her breathy retort. I know, it stayed. The Irish never could throw a party. I'm Irish. Her eyes gleamed with amusement. I have time to show you that Sicilians throw better celebrations, he said. Uh, I said, without whiskey lubricating everything. Her laughter made my heart pound as she told me. It's a good thing you waited for them to leave before you started throwing shade at the Irish. I'm not as hardcore as Aidan Jr. How do you know him, I asked. We're the godparents for the son of our mutual friends. Now, of course, he's dating Savannah. You're close? To Savannah, very. To Aidan, less so. I trailed my finger higher along her forearm, and her gaze moved with the digit as it traced up and along to the internal centre of her elbow. She watched its journey, whereas I watched her. I noted when she swallowed thickly, stroking the thin, almost ethereal blue veins there, and a soft mule escaped her when I slipped it higher up her arm, along the curve of her shoulder and back down again. You were disappointed your guest didn't arrive? I inserted, now her attention was split. Her eyes darted to mine, and deep within them, I saw a peculiar panic combined with the lust I'd stirred in her. It was my ex. He's taken me he's taking me to court for keying his ferrari i was hoping aiden would scare him into dropping the suit it's a lot of money and she sighed i just don't have it silently i made a promise to her i would have this headley drop this lawsuit i'd even get an apology for his infidelity she didn't have to know i'd draw blood to achieve both well aware that the lighter touch would have her shivering i hovered my fingers over the back of her hand as i traced a circle there goosebumps appeared followed by the tiniest of shivers would you like to go dancing with me i asked her watching her blink a few times as she drifted onto the new subject ever heard of stranger danger she whispered you do not know who i am do you no i don't aside from lucio valentini but i can guess your bad news if you're friends with aiden I like the taste of my name on your lips, I murmured, but that she associated me with bad news was something I had to change. There are thousands of people in this city who should fear me, but you're not one of them. She stared into my eyes before slowly tipping her head, uh, her forehead forward in silent assent. I'll dance with you. So Jen, that same evening. Because I was on the hunt for a rich husband, I knew most hotties in Midtown by this point. My position at a firm of accountants that regularly serviced the Wall Street 1% meant that I should have at least come across a Lucy Valentini before. This guy, however, was new to me. Very new. But God, as much as I loved fresh blood, I couldn't avoid the fact that this one was dangerous. Dangerous enough to take a seat at a table with the heir to the Irish mob without fearing for his life. You have beautiful eyes, Jennifer, he told me softly, his finger moving along the curve of my chin, stealing my breath and making my heart skip a beat. Thank you, I whispered, entranced by his stare, overwhelmed by it. Sir, he blinked, the fog between us fading as he turned to the server. The check and our coats P favori. When the waiter returned, Lucio paid the check and placed a credit card inside the leather folder he'd been handed. Taking the opportunity to study him, I took in the Rolex, an odd selection because as costly as they were, they weren't the usual choice for a mogul, and the simple diamond cufflinks on his sleeves. Because I was an old pro at this, I did a quick guesstimate on his outfit and figured he was wearing over 50 grams worth of gear, minimum. That depended on the type of Rolex, of course. Suits like the one he wore didn't come cheap, either. The hand stitching on the lapels was so tiny that even this close to him, I had to squint to see the individual stitches was it bad that i wanted to run my tongue along them well okay but not bad just weird another server arrived with our coats and against the expensive wool of his top coat mine looked even more ridiculous skimpy as barely there as my dress and not at all made for the weather we were having for the first time i felt ashamed against his saturnine elegance i was dressed like a whore everything in this life fiona bar comes at a price make sure someone else pays the tab my mother's words haunted me, but she was right. I dressed this way so that if Aidan hadn't been able to scare Damien into dropping the lawsuit, I'd hoped that seducing him would make this nightmare go away. I should have known the bleep wouldn't come. That was what I got for daring to hope. Come, Jennifer, let me show how uh, let me show you how Sicilians throw a party. And I will leave it there <laughs> because it gets quite uh, passionate <laughs> afterward. Sorry, I muted us all. Let me unmute everybody real quick. <laughs> there we go. Now we can talk. <laughs> yeah. Woohoo. I just did a very nice. short one. Now that is a very, very short scene, but I just thought, you know, let's keep it PG. <laughs> yeah. Well, you definitely have some fans. How do you say his yeah. name? Lucia. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's a very, this is the Sicilian language is fascinating i went down a rabbit hole and i was very fortunate to find um a lady who was married to, to a sicilian and mm -hmm. i sent him this list of words <laughs> and there were some rude ones and there were some funny ones and i was like he must think i'm insane asking these questions <laughs> and he sent them back to me and it uh. was 
all of these like really strange words and there's like that, that you can kind of see a link to italian but sicilian yeah. oh it's so much hotter but the names are more huh? complicated <laughs> well there are definitely so, can, can i ask you how many how many yes Sorry. how many Go languages ahead. do you speak do you do you speak more than one language well uh, I used to speak a lot more than I do now. At the moment, I mostly speak Spanish just because of Spain and my mum lives here and everything. Mm -hmm. But I used to speak French as well. Not not so much anymore, though. I, I struggle with those and I struggled with for a long time. Um, and then as I got, as I became a writer, I just, it was really bad, but I let them drop, you know, because mm -hmm. you've got to focus so much on one thing. And French and German wasn't a priority anymore. I wanted to be a teacher. And then I started writing, you know, math theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like now I use it a little bit in some things and um my uh, executive assistant she's actually French Canadian as well so she's French okay. um and she uh you know she helps me with like a lot she she lived in America so she helps me with American terms sometimes cuz like you you know we speak the same language but there are so many different yes yeah so many different changes you know things that don't correlate and stuff like that so I'm I'm kind of I know it sounds crazy, but I think I had to learn American English and prioritize American English <laughs> over French and German. <laughs> I feel the same way, though. I had to learn Amer I had to learn how to write in American English because I learned British English, mm -hmm. right? So I had to like flip my re's and I had to take out u's. And even in Canada, I'm always amazed because my editor is American, and I'm always amazed when I get the note, "We don't have that here." You might want to explain. It's like, what do you mean you don't have something that seems so common to me mm -hmm. in Canada? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh. Okay. It's really yeah. true. And it's very annoying because it's just so obviously, uh, you know, it's peppered throughout everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And it, just, you know, it goes down to brands as well. Yeah. Like, I had this right. thing, uh, when I had an issue with, uh, I wanted to use a floor cleaner. So I Googled it and I'm like looking for this floor cleaner. So I used Swiffer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like, when she read it, she was like, no, you would use Lysol for this. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> right, okay, then I'll use Lysol. <laughs> <laughs> but it's That's just funny. like everything it, it's it fascinates me though i've got to say it's um all of the different changes like the spellings don't matter but just the colloquialisms mm -hmm. and i you know i i'm focused on pri primarily i'm focused on the irish american side of things but i've today is the first sicilian book um that i've that i've done like i've you know, uh, expanded my territory sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, until now, there's loads of Irish terms and uh, they're from Southern, well, it's not Southern Ireland, obviously, but it's not Northern Ireland, it's the actual mm -hmm. Ireland. And um, I have a fan who, um, wonderful, wonderful lady, and her husband is, he's Irish. So I ask him really random questions as well. Mm -hmm. I was like, do you, did your mum have a song that she maybe sang while she was washing, you know, doing the dishes? <laughs> And he's like, okay, right. And he gave me one and it's a rattling bog. And that's actually in the <laughs> Oh funny. Oh, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. I, I do a, like a lot of really random esoteric research and I love it. Mm -hmm. I gotta say that like, it gives me a, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but it gives me a lady boner. I'm not, <laughs> not, a, I'm not afraid to admit it. <laughs> oh that's, that's funny. Fancy when you say it with your accent. So I'm yeah. sure you okay <laughs> uh, yeah i don't think facebook is gonna flag anything with your accent so we'll see i have to say with americans and well north americans i get i get away with a lot just because of the accent it's, it's kind of great it's like a, you know, <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't test it like, yeah, with with the speaking and swearing and stuff i get away with it <laughs> well and i think when you do that when you you know bring in things like that like a song and things i mean it just it grounds it. it it makes it feel like you've really done your research and then people who i mean that's my biggest fears you know i if i were to write a book and you know say I, I like to use fictional cities a lot of times because that way i don't run into that you know it's like if i'm writing a story and it's set in manhattan and i'm you know saying they're at you know whatever this intersection and then i say there's a starbucks or something and then somebody's gonna say no there's not you know? yeah but but i it's that, so that just rounds them in the story, though. When you have yeah. those experiences and things like that, I think that's fantastic. Because, like, my my world is my this universe is based in uh, West Orange, New Jersey, and mm -hmm. New York City. I spend so much time on Google Maps, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, looking at this. And then I tell you what's really great as well. If you go on YouTube, they have these. It's a very bizarre thing, and maybe they're doing it just for writers. But they just walk. There's people who just walk around. They just yeah. walk around filming it. And so mine is based in, uh, there, there's a, 
my Irish mob series is called uh, the Five Points Mob Collection. There is an mm. area in New York City yeah. don't it, called the Five Points. Mm -hmm. So like, and it's in Hell's Kitchen. And there's this guy and he takes me and I'm just watching him walk around Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I know Hell's Kitchen now. I could go there mm -hmm. and it'd be absolutely fine. So I, I do I do, do a lot of research into that. And um, it's always funny because your distances <laughs> amaze me. Like I will say, oh, it's like across the country. Mm -hmm. And it's my editor's like, Gemma, uh, sorry, that's my real name, but Serena, she's like, Serena, <laughs> Ohio to New York is not far. It is not <laughs> over the country. It's not across the country. It's like up. And I'm like, it's a six hour drive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's a six hour drive. Like to me, an hour drive is far. Mm -hmm. I know oh. it's just a short drive. I do that in a day. And I'm like, okay, you do that in a day, right? But I come across all these things all the time. It's uh, the spice of life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny how different it is. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of the fact that I've had people come to Vancouver and go to the locations that I've talked about. And then they'll report back. And I'm like, yay. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is awesome. Um, we do have one question. Serena, what made you choose America for your setting? <sighs> I d well, I actually have a lot of books based in um, the UK as well. I, I do have quite a few based in Europe. But for this particular one, you know, our mafia in this area is very different to the American mafia. And, um, you know, we have it like in Spain, they have a, they have a mafia. And in Italy, they do like they, they have, you know, a big a big big factions there but i didn't want to do it for this i really wanted to be in new york city and as well i had um i like to make things hard for myself so i have <laughs> this universe where it's basically there is an mc universe in new jersey who deals with the irish mob in new york city and now there is this sicilian faction like i say in the same city so they all interconnect mm -hmm. can't really do that in europe you just can't mm. and there's so much more scope there's, unfortunately there's a lot of violence in america so it's like very feasible we don't have guns you know we don't have those kind of things it's kind of sad for a very sad reason i'm sorry <laughs> but um you know it's i'm not saying that there's no crime here because of course there is but uh it's just a different kind of culture and in new york you have so many gangs and it's very mm -hmm. very easy to research like uh, mm -hmm. I, I do spend a lot of time on YouTube, I'm not going to lie. And I, I watch like um, documentaries about Rikers, about Rikers Island, you know, the prisons and stuff like that, the way that they live, kind of aggressive stuff. Because I used to be like, Deborah, I used to do paranormal and things mm -hmm. like that. And uh, I always, with those ones, I always actually base them in the US. I think uh, I've never been, I've never been to America, but it's uh, oh. I'm going next year, I'm going to a polycon. So, oh, awesome. Oh. Yeah. DC and I have no idea. I'm gonna. I was gonna be absolutely. I'm gonna be like this, looking around. <laughs> I have to base a book there. <laughs> so let me ask you both, because um, you write paranormal and you write uh, mafia. So you obviously, I'm, I'm thinking obviously, write alpha heroes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So have you ever written a beta? Yes. You have. Okay. No. As a as a mafia or as a um, paranormal, Serena. For me, um, I have oh, I I until last year I mostly released reverse harem. Okay. I have like about I've put them together a lot of them, but I have about eighty books out. So I have over the years kind of done a lot of different stuff, and uh, wherever whatever floats my boat, I sort of just go in that direction. So. Um, I have this one particular harem and there are seven guys in it. So obviously you can't have seven just alphas. It'd be really tedious. You have to have yeah. people who will not necessarily betas, like, like I'm not saying that or omegas or whatever, but just like there's got to be push and pull. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody who would be like an Uber alpha and then mm -hmm. there's somebody who's, who's beta. And then who, and I find actually the betas keep the peace. Yeah. <laughs> they keep the peace. So I'm asking because I was on a, um, an episode of What the Trope um, a couple months ago, and we were talking about paranormal, or uh, no, it was, what was it, Dylan? What was the What the Trope? Um, no, we've done several of them now. I know. Anyways, it was a paranormal. Um, oh, Faded Mates. It was a Faded yeah. Mates. 
Yep. Um, and they were talking, have you ever re read a paranormal book that has a beta hero? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm so excited about this. Yeah, it's not mine. I don't read beta heroes. Like it's not, I mean, I guess that's why I keep writing alphas, but not alpha holes. I don't like them to be jerks, but they're mm -hmm. alphas. And then I read uh, Haley Edwards, The Beginner's Guide to Necromancy. And it starts okay. with an alpha hero and becomes more about a beta male who is phenomenal. Like I completely fall in love with it. I was so impressed and delighted by her characterization of him. Yeah, but I think that's the only one I've come across really. I don't okay. know if you guys read Reverse Harem, but um, there is a really great one by Catherine Moon called uh, Lola and the Millionaires. And one of the main characters, he is an Omega. So he's like technically in the structure, the paranormal structure, he is like the, the lowest of the low. But they it's a sweet verse. She calls it a sweet verse. That is a very interesting dynamic. And the, the, he has very interesting things that he does. I will say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> eggplant, insert eggplant emoji here. Yeah, he has very. So if you like reverse hurry, I would give that a go as well, because that's a very, very unusual take on it. Mm -hmm. You do find it in MM paranormal. Like I have read it. I haven't. Haley's was the only MF paranormal I've read it in, but I have read it a lot in MM paranormal. Have you read M? Have you ever which? read M Preg? Read which? M Preg. M oh no, I haven't. <laughs> no, I've, I've I'm read fascinated one. by it, but I haven't read it. <laughs> I've read one. It was very unusual. Like it's. it's, it's, it's I'm strange. sure. How we can accept that there are men who change into wolves. And that there are vampires, but that's that's the weird thing. The weird thing is that it's weird. <laughs> it was it was an interesting experience. Yeah, <laughs> we did have a question. Um, what did somebody say? Oh, what is a beta? Karen wants to beta. Who wants to answer that one? I can. Well, well I mean, uh, it, there is a there is technically a scale of uh, you know of a hierarchy among men. So the alpha goes at the top, then it's the beta on the next level. And then depending on the world, omega, gamma, but it, that, those two can, uh, those two can switch. And a beta guy is somebody who has some of the traits of an alpha, but he is not as uber aggressive. He, he can control himself. I think we would say that like a human guy is a beta male technically. Mm -hmm. And then the alpha traits come out in this, you know, the werewolf or the vampire, this, the supernatural, um, you know, the supernatural part. I don't know if you agree with that, Deborah, but you know, maybe I do. Don't. And I think too, like when it comes to like in paranormal with packs and stuff, the beta will be like the second in command. I yes. think maybe per perhaps even in mafia romances, the beta would yeah. be the second in like a conciliary might be a beta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the under yeah, it's the I, they're in every part of our lives, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we have hierarchy, natural hierarchies. You can't always have, you know, you can't always have loads of bosses. You've got to have somebody yeah. who's mm -hmm. under the we just lost on <laughs> her <internet. laughs> um, that's so interesting because i've always heard like alpha and then um like an alpha is an alpha you know like mega testosterone kind of driven when you you know think of a uber masculine it's my way um that kind of a thing um super protective and, and dominating and everything and then i've always heard like a beta is more um like a like almost like your cinnamon roll kind of hero where he's a little more gentle and a little more sensitive. And then I've always heard that the um, gamma is like a beta and an alpha together. So he's got like, he can go full on alpha when he wants, but then he can also be more of a beta. So I that's think it, this. I think it, I think it depends like each author, obviously mm -hmm. you know, we take creative liberty and we oh, make it. Right. Iconic. You know, like I have a series called uh, the trial for Chronicles and, um, Oh gosh, I'm gonna age myself here because I'm not I'm not totally uh, au fait with it because it was a long time ago that I wrote it. But one of the heroes, he is considered a gamma, which is the lowest of the low within the pack hierarchy. And uh, over the course of the series, he actually turns he morphs into a beta with his uh, lady love, who strengthens who gives him strength, sort of thing. But um, you know, I think I think everybody does it differently. If you read an Omega verse, betas are uh just like humans yeah. you know, okay that's, that's they're just like humans. whereas like i think 
you know, like Addison, um, Addison K, I think it's Addison K, you know, she she does like Omega Romance and her alphas are like, they're super, 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 super charged, mm -hmm. uh, like to, to what to what we do. I mean, you've got to be careful as well without throwing around the word alpha with Amazon because they yeah. like them to ban us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This word that is so natural to us, but it's, uh, yeah, so. Maybe yes. that's it's well one of the banned words now. How crazy that's is that? Damn. Well. I know. Goodness. Dylan, what was the last question we got to? Um, just what was what's a beta? Okay, so we got a ton more. That too. Um Gail had a question before that too. I'll pop that one up there. So <laughs> how many books do I write in a year? <laughs> well, um, okay, so I I write very fast and it is my full time job. This is my career. So um this year, for example, I've written 800,000 words. Um, I've just, and then this year I've released six, six books, five books. I think it's five and I have another three to come out. But before this year, I'm slowing down. I <laughs> doesn't feel like it. I know. But last year, I think I, I, I was releasing um, one to two books a month. Wow. Yeah, a month. So over the last, wow, week, it, it, it definitely, it definitely adds up. But mm -hmm. that's, um, so how, I, oh, sorry. No, I was gonna say, how many words are your books? Like, are they are they full lengths? Um, well, for example, the one that I released in July was one hundred and seventy thousand words. Whoa! <laughs> Holy yeah. cow! I, I I write big books, and I cannot lie. Um, I and guess the, and fast. Full full lengths. <laughs> and the duet is um, they're both eighty thousand words a piece. Um, but I, I, I have like a variation, like I have some that are, uh, like the professor, for example, that's, that's an MF. I think you can guess what he does for a living, can I, you know, the professor, um, you know, that's like 70, 80,000 words. So I, I've always been, uh, I, I attribute it to the fact that I, I write so many different things. It's only this last year where I've really streamlined into mafia and MC, but even so MC and mafia, there's a lot of differences. So mm -hmm. I used to leapfrog from paranormal. To contemporary then i do witches and then i would do like uh, academy and so you know as i said before variety is the spice of life and mm -hmm. it kept me it kept me it kept me going and i i really enjoy what i do so yeah <laughs> so i am young for it but yeah <laughs> <laughs> very focused mm. That's awesome yeah. Very focused, too yes. focused. I think I think my mum would say. <laughs> yeah, that that is that can be a drawback to being oh. so so focused. Is yeah. Yeah, I'm, I I think um, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of it, especially because like this past uh, this since last January, it's when I created this universe. So the first book came out in this universe, and it was called Nix. And uh, now in that particular series, there are eight books, and then in the Irish Mob there's five and then by the end of by next next week i will be releasing the second book in the duet so um there will be two out in my italian so mm -hmm. i i like it as well my readers my readers are used to it now mm -hmm. <laughs> complicated conspiracies on a fast timeline <laughs> <laughs> well should we have um oh. Deborah read before we get to more questions just to make sure that we have yes. Time. Yes. And then, and then when we get back, Serena, tell me how many words a day you write. Cause I'm going to see if you can be our, our, um, top. So when we get back, when we get back, okay. Okay. Tom's okay. all about the competition. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Deborah, what are you reading for us tonight? You're, you're reading from throwing shade. And yes. I'm reading from my paranormal book one in my PWF series. And, um, I am reading the part where the uh, my main character Miriam meets uh, the wolf shifter, who will come to play a large part in her life. All right. Um, yes, and so I'll just set up a few things so you guys understand some terms. Um, most people in the, this world don't have magic, and they're called sapiens, or if people are being rude, saps. Uh, and the people who do have magic, the majority of them are called aurists. Uh, and but Miriam is not an Oris, she's a Banim Shovavim and descended from Lilith. Uh, and so she can animate her shadow and she can cloak herself into invisibility. Her animated shadow is called Delilah. And uh, the other term you need to know are lone stars are magic cops in this world. 
Interesting. Uh, and oh, I'm so excited. Lot, about this. And I tried to cover everything, so I hope I caught everything. And <laughs> this is PG 13. So All yes. right. We will see you after. Okay. Yeah. The wolf snagged Alex by the pant leg and dragged him back, giving the man a grass and dirt facial. Alex's shadow vibrated so hard it was palpable. My stomach, somewhere in the vicinity of my toes, I stepped forward with my hands up. Don't kill him. The wolf bared his lips, leaning onto his prey's back with one paw. Was the wolf enemy of my enemy my friend? He tried to force himself on me the other night, I said, and he may be responsible for my missing friend. Please help me get answers. No matter how much Alex struggled, the animal didn't budge. Under his unnerving primal stare, I was about to get the hell out of Dodge when the wolf barked, sounding a tad impatient. He flicked his tail at my combat-ready shadow. The aura shifter understood me, but that didn't mean he'd cooperate. I was a goldfish trying to reason with a shark. You don't like that? No problem. I returned Delilah to a neutral position. The clear peal of a trumpet sounded. I jerked my head around, searching for the source. Did you hear... The wolf's claws extended, glowing like they were made of pure light, and he tore into Alex's chest, ripping out his heart and dropping it back into the body cavity with a wet splat. Alex went limp, his head twisted to face me, and a swirling phantom of crimson and gray exploded out of his corpse. I shrieked and ducked, meeting Alex's lifeless stare. His shadow once again looked normal, the putrescence now freed and dive-bombing the wolf, who leapt, growling and attempting to cold catch hold of the mass. What was the sick, bloody ghost thing? Why was the sick, bloody ghost thing still going like the Energizer buddy? And why did Alex have to die? I didn't mourn the piece of crap, but this wasn't right. He should have faced justice, except that th thought warred with my desire to push the wolf aside and rid the world of the phantom thing myself. The pulsing entity whipped close to my face, anger roiling off it, and I flung my hands up. Never mind. Let the wolf handle it, because unless I could vanquish this thing with the power of sarcasm, I had no clue how to fight it. As the dying sunlight slipped away, the angry ghost mass attacked the wolf faster and faster, but the aura shifter fought it off in a blur of motion. A car alarm in the distance beeped insistently. The wolf sank his front claws into the crimson and gray specter that had burst out of Alex's corpse, holding it aloft like meat on a spit. Rays of golden light sprouted out from the wolf's back paws, blooming across his legs and torso with a hypnotic fluidity. It turned his white fur into a blinding snowscape that forced me to shield my eyes. His emerald eyes turned black and a pained howl burst out of the animal, a desolate sound that shivered up my spine. Keeping the crimson mask speared on one front paw, the wolf flexed his other one, slashing his glowing claws through the air and opening a portal into a yawning chasm. I clasped my hands over my ears, the half humming, half vibrating noise emanating from it, hitting me at a painful frequency. And yet I crept closer, awed at the maelstrom of storm clouds on the other side. A plume of fog rolled in with jagged movements that reminded me of teeth. Goosebumps prickled my skin, but I was unable to turn away. Even the stench of rotting onions that belched from the gap did little to dissuade me. Had the wolf really torn a hole to another dimension or was this an illusion? The wolf flung the writhing mass into the chasm and the wind on the other side picked up with a furious howl. Cars, people, cell phones, all sound on my side narrowed down like it was far away. Reality suspended until the light drained from the wolf and with a quiet whoosh, he was released from his torment. The portal winked shut, the crimson mass gone. The world snapped back into a cacophony of sound and motion and I released the breath I'd been holding. The animal's claws returned to their normal color and he bowed his head, his flanks heaving. I sagged against the railing on the walkway in horrified fascination. My relief that the blight from Alex's shadow was no longer around froze into icy spears stabbing into me with the certainty that the wolf would turn his focus to me now. I tried to grab his shadow as I'd done with Alex's, but I couldn't. It remained on the ground like all the others. The wolf's fur rippled. Oh, I whispered, having never seen a werewolf change before. A stripe of skin appeared over the ridges of his spine and his claws morphed into fingers. It was almost like watching a sunset on a foreign moon, an alien light cascading through darkness in little peaks, and then a more steady glow illuminating a rugged foreign landscape. Unfamiliar, but beautiful in its own way. But maybe I made a noise or something or my oh was too loud because the wolf growled and shifted fully back into his animal form with a crazed glint in his once more emerald eyes. I jumped backwards, smacking my tailbone on the railing. 
beautiful? Was I crazy? He was a wolf shifter with lethal instincts, a canny intelligence, and if that failed, top claws and teeth made for snacking on me. He lunged, his jaws barely missing my side. I bolted, a scream caught in my throat, running blindly across the smaller plaza until I stopped, winded and gulping down air with my arms over my head to get rid of the stitch in my side. I blew a strand of hair off my flushed face. Who did that wolf think he was anyway? My magic was out of the bag and I wasn't leaving without answers, even if it was nothing more than Alex's driver's license with a last name and address to follow up. I stormed back to the stairs, making no effort to hide my approach. A man kneeled next to Alex's body. He seemed a few years younger than me, probably in his late 30s, and was about six inches taller, putting the shifter at about six foot two. His hair was a riot of dark curls. The man's jaw was firm, his lips full, but right now they were set in a severe line. Moonlight kissed the olive skin of his broad shoulders and leanly muscled torso, a trail of hair leading down to jeans. I gusted out of breath. The man huffed softly. You came back, he said dryly, with a slight accent I couldn't place. You've got chutzpah, I'll give you that. I gave a weak laugh and he locked his brilliant emerald gaze onto mine. Thickly lashed, his eyes were what I would have called beautiful in his human form, but there was a hardness to them, like he'd seen too much and all innocence was long gone. Eli had looked that way after his first year in homicide. Damn, this guy had to be a lone star. Okay, looking on the bright side, he could help me find Jude if he didn't destroy me. I'd been so bent on getting answers from Alex that I'd thrown away every single safety procedure that I'd lived by and shown a stranger my magic. I could have left when the shifter took off with Alex, but no, I had to play detective. I reached behind me, clutching the railing to bolster my rubbery legs. The Oris reached into a duffel bag, revealing a nasty silver scar that ran halfway up the left side of his back and pulled on a faded blue t-shirt that said, bite me. This wasn't a gym rat with a six pack for show. He was a warrior and his body was his well-honed weapon in or out of wolf form. Oris magic was based in light and life while Benim Shovavim powers were rooted in death and darkness. Historically, they'd taken that as clear cut signs of good and evil. They pitied sapiens, but had hunted my kind into near extinction. There was even a skipping game sung by Oris kids. Clap for the light, cause light is right. All other magic is a blight. How many shadow freaks will we smite? At which point they'd jump as fast as they could while counting. I eyed the wolf shifter with a sinking feeling that he'd probably counted pretty high. Pretty high. Maybe he didn't remember the exact details of his time in his wolf form. Could I bluff my way out of here? Did you want something, he said impatiently. My brain short-circuited. I'm guessing that light magic allowed you to cut through the breastbone and rib cage with only using your claws, I said. But why isn't there blood all over the place? I could have smacked myself. This was not the time for curiosity or further questions like, how do you have more than one magic ability? It was the time for well-crafted lies. The magic cauterized the blood vessels. The man rolled his R's. He grabbed a box of table salt from the duffel bag. Regular sodium, I said thickly. How bland. I prefer pink Himalayan to balance the delicate flavor of human flesh. I'm not eating him. He dumped the salt over the corpse. It interferes with the scent so animals don't show up before Oris get here to retrieve the body. That's good because cannibalism can make you sick. You get this brain disease called Kuru and like mad cow. He tapped the last of the salt onto the body with a contemplative expression. I blinked. People didn't generally come back with follow-up questions to my random facts. Not quite. People can't get mad cow disease, but in rare cases, they get a form called... I shook my head because cows, mad or otherwise, were not the issue. Was Alex human? Or was he some other species entirely? And did that make a difference to the answer? He had looked human, even if what was inside of him wasn't. My moral compass was having trouble finding true north. Not anymore, the wolfman said. I knelt down beside Alex to close his lids because his lifeless stare felt accusatory, but the shifter batted my arm away. He lay a hand on the deceased's forehead and stared into his eyes as if committing him to memory. There was both a gravitas and a resignation in the shifter's expression, and I couldn't tell if he did this to honor the dead or to torment himself with a parade of his kills. Maybe it was one and the same. When he was done, I checked Alex's back pockets for his wallet. The man's body isn't even cold and you're robbing him, Wolf Dude said. I'm looking for identification, I said through ground teeth. There was a cracked phone, but no wallet. It must have fallen out at some point during the fight. A vise tightened around my chest and I shoved the Oris, banking on the fact that if he'd intended to hurt me, he'd have done it already. You ruined my chance to get information about, I saved you. 
The man stuffed his bare feet into motorcycle boots, which also came out of the duffel bag. I don't know what interrogation skills you think you have, but I can assure you that Dybbuk wouldn't give up crap. Dybbuk? Merde, he said in perfect French. Ah, you went after him without knowing what you were dealing with? His full lips twisted. Freaking BS. He remembered. I took two wobbly steps back, Delilah by my side, but he didn't come after me. He laced up his boots. Okay, he was a derisive son of a bitch, but he lacked the horror others of his ilk displayed upon meeting my kind, nor did he seem inclined to kill me. I'd take the win. Alex had attacked me once already, I said, and if he did something to my friend... The shifter pulled out a beaten up brown leather jacket and shrugged into it, his shoulders bunching. Then she's gone. Sorry for your loss. My eyebrows shot up. Yes, this guy was a jerk, but surely he was connected to an infrastructure that could help me find Jude. Sorry for your loss? How about you help me find her? Aren't you a lone star? He laughed without an ounce of humor. Hardly. Then what was he? He'd already killed one person, and yes, that Dybbuk thing seemed to justify Alex's death, but I was alone out here. If he was working on his own vigilante moral code, how safe was I? I eyed the stairs. How many were there? 30? Then perhaps another 50 feet to lose myself in the crowds? He'd be faster than me, even as a human. I bit my lip. If I screamed for help, would anyone come? Screw that. I had magic and could cloak and get away at any point, but his rudeness was grating. I threw my hands up. That's all you have to say? No. The man raked a shrewd glance over me. Should we ever have the misfortune to meet again? Get out of my way. Or what? You'll huff and you'll puff and you'll blow my house down? He bared his lips, briefly shifting his canines to wolf form. My, what big teeth you have. A strangled laugh burbled out of me. My epistemological, my epistemological crisis involved a hell of a Freudian undertone. I'll do whatever is necessary, he said. Is that your action hero catchphrase or something? Because it's a little on the nose. He zipped up the duffel bag. My reputation doesn't perceive me? Shocking. His voice was laced with bitterness. Wow, someone is full of themselves. I've got no idea who you are. He peered at me suspiciously. Are you new in town? No. He shrugged. Then you know who I am. Hate to disappoint you, but you're just some rando who crashed my party and ruined my plan. To get answers from someone who wouldn't tell you anything you actually wanted to know. Brilliant strategy. You've the mind of a tactician. Even if you did get something out of him, did you think he'd let you walk away after? His accent thickened when he got annoyed. I had my shadow. I wouldn't brag about that if I were you. For your information, I'm doing an admirable job. Before yesterday, the only monsters I had to worry about were of the human variety. I shot him a pointed look. There's no way you didn't know about Dybbuk's. You're too... He snapped his mouth shut. Delilah puffed up behind me. Oh no, I said, finish that sentence. The man crossed his arms, rustling the leather. Old, he said levelly. My shadow bopped Wolfman in the nose with a swift jab. Ha! The man pinched his nostrils together to staunch the bleeding, his emerald eyes glinting dangerously. My amusement drained away, my magic swirling around my feet, ready to cloak me, but I'd hit the wall and I was out of Fs to give. Should we ever have the misfortune to meet again? Get out of my way, I said. Vraiment? Why? I'm a woman in my 40s who's remembered how powerful she can be. Don't mess with me, Huff and Puff. Held head, head held high, Delilah and I sailed past him into the night. <laughs> Whew, I caught all the swear words and replaced them. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Loved that. Thank you. Yeah. You have a really unique world there. Thank I mean, you. Yeah. I Sometimes I worry it's just me and like my crazy thoughts and <laughs> head and and I snicker to myself and I think I'm not going to be amusing anyone except myself. So I'm always very happy when people are like, I really liked your book. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. So let me ask you, how do you come up with, I'm not, I'm not talking about character names, but the names for things like. I, I mean, I like do a lot of research um, and I find I have this huge document of stuff that I've scoured from like the Old Testament and Jewish folklore mythology. Yeah. And I just find things that are of interest and then I come back to them or I just go into deep dives on them yeah. and I'll come across something else and then that'll trigger 
So uh, like she's, Ganim Shovavim, for example, really is referenced, is, is a term in the Old Testament for the children of Lilith that were considered the rebellious ones mm -hmm. or the, de you know, demon children of Lilith. So it's a real thing that I just took and kind of put a bit of my own spin on. So mm -hmm. like the, um, the shadow, what, what does she do? What's her power? Shadow? Her shadow magic. Yeah. Shadow magic. It's like, how did you come up with that? The name for her shadow well, that was, oh, for her, yes. for Delilah, uh, I think I just, I just love Delilah in the Old Testament. But I mean, the shadow of magic idea itself, all, all of my urban fantasy deal with gender politics in one form or another. And I carried that through into um, this book. And the reason she has shadow magic um, is because I just remember turning 40 and starting to feel very invisible as the years went on and starting to feel like. I had, I was somehow marginalized, like, I don't know, pushed to the sidelines, I guess, not marginalized, but pushed to the sidelines. And so just feeling like there are all these wonderful, amazing, accomplished women out there. And it was like just seeking to reclaim the power. How do you, and then there was a whole thought about you don't have shadow without light and stepping into, so it's like my brain just kind of goes on these, you know, wrap down these yeah. rabbit holes of thoughts and yeah. I guess that kind of goes to one question I saw, which was, how did you decide to write like older women versus the younger women? Yeah, because I wrote younger women in my my two um, urban fantasy series. So um, the Unlikable Demon Hunter was my first one. And then the Jezebel Files is my second one. Um, the characters are 20 and 28, respectively. And I thought that's kind of where I would have to play was because urban fantasy really sits there's a lot of 20 year olds, uh, 20 somethings in urban fantasy. But when PWF came out, so in case people aren't familiar with PWF, it was started by a group of female authors called the Fab 13. And these are all hugely best selling authors in um, uh, urban fantasy, paranormal cozy. Um, uh, I know I'm missing other things that they've written as well. Anyways, they're amazing authors and they decided to carve out a space for heroines that were over 40 who still wanted to have magic adventures and love. And so it's really cool because people come, people who are writing PWF come to it from different ways. Some might bring more of a paranormal cozy mystery feel into it and not have the heat levels. Or, you know, I just bring all my urban fantasy and love of sexy romance to it. So it's, you know, a steamier side. So yeah, that's that's why when, when I realized there was a market for this and readers were just, they wanted so desperately. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like I grew up watching Buffy and reading fantasy and urban fantasy. And of course there were going to be other people, but I guess we internalize hearing that, no, the market is, you know, younger people. And so it's been really wonderful and wonderful connecting with these women, these readers. Yeah. Okay. Serena, did you have a question? I did actually, Deborah. So I was very curious. So you're, heroines are old which is fantastic what are your heroes are they the same age or is it like are the alpha are, you know werewolves can be like 200 years old are, are they you know i was wondering about the dynamic there uh so laura my wolf shifter he's 37 okay um how old and how old? miriam's 42 right okay oh okay yes. right do you, do you write older heroes as well or do you always do younger heroes my heroes have always this is actually the first book that has had vampires or shifters in it all my other books. So my first series had demons, but no vampires or shifters. Mm. And everybody, all the main cast were human. So they were all in their early 20s, the, the first series. And then the Jezebel Files, they're like 28 to 30. Like it's, again, but they're all human. So mm -hmm. yeah, and there were no demons or anything. It was purely human magic in the second series. It's very common, isn't it, in like um, the paranormal world to have like thousand year old heroes. <laughs> yeah. I like having humans. I like the dynamic that having humans, you know, it brings. I do have a vampire who's, you know, hundreds of years old, but he's not a love interest by any means. No. So, yeah. It's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? How we, we rarely have older women heroines. Rarely. Like, mm -hmm. even, like I said, then, like, I, I, I actually have a an older female vampire but it's very rare and it shouldn't be why is it why is it that way i know i know because we've somehow been convinced no one wants it and it's not true in the least mm -hmm. yeah now, i've been really excited to see the rise of paranormal women's fiction um and there are yeah. 
like you said, a, a lot of big names that yes. are writing in that space. And yeah, yeah it's Kate been fun Green. to, to watch. Green. Sorry? Is Kay Green? Green? Yes, she, yes, right. absolutely. She's one of the originators of it. And I have to say one thing about them because I'm also in their group as well. And I've been, you know, they, they, provides space for other author, guest authors to come in and do takeovers when we have releases. And I have to say, the one of the things that's so wonderful about it is they're so inclusive and generous and just kind. You know, when you get that kind of respect and support from a top down, mm -hmm. it just makes it a really wonderful space to play and write in. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in some indie spaces that were not as kind, mm -hmm. but this one is just outstanding. Like it's just women supporting women and it's lovely. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think, you know, when, when we think about it as authors, it's like, there's so many authors and so many books. And, you know, when you hear the stats, how many books are released on Amazon every single day, but yet, you know, it's like readers are always going to be able to read so much faster than we can yeah. write a book. Even if Serena's, mm -hmm. reading, you know, two books a month, um, <laughs> you know, some of these readers, y'all are so fast. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, book and, we'll read two books a day, you know, yeah. and it, like, yeah. there's absolutely no way that um, that any author would ever be able to keep up with. I, I know a reader who their readers seven, seven books a day. What? Wow. Holy cow. You process it or do you just like speed read? And she says, oh, no, she processes it. And I was wow. like, oh, really? Because I'm a fast reader. I could, I can read two books a day. But yeah, seven? me too. Holy fuck. Like, uh, how, how long are these books, though? <laughs> oh, I mean, $80,000, $80,000. That's an expensive <laughs> book. 80,000 <laughs> words. My book. books are all like eighty five to 100,000. Okay. Yeah. I, I okay. If she was reading like eighty thousand word books or like ten thousand word books a day, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Was that would make more sense, I guess. But still, yeah. she's like, mm. she was very, very. She classified it as that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, no reason to disbelieve her. But yeah. yeah. So that goes to kind of to the question that I um, paused. How many words a day can you write a day? Well, it, it depends on two things. If I am the end of a book. I can do like 25,000. What? A day? Okay. I think she tops it. I think she beat Amy Dawes. Sustainable. I think Amy. I don't keep track of these things, Dawn. <laughs> I, I, think I think I can do 12,000. Stepped out at 25. Holy cow. Yep. I don't know if you had that. That's amazing. Sustainably, it's 12. Like 25 is when I'm on a deadline. And I don't want to do 25,000. Like it's just, you know, circumstances. <laughs> mm -hmm. And have you ever okay, dictated I or do you type? Pardon? Sorry? Have you ever dictated or I've, do you type? I've tried dictation. Oh, mm -hmm. God. It just, it really drives me crazy. You know, open quote, I did this, close, you know, comma, close quote. He said, it drives me insane. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. So I, I, I do it all by writing. It does depend on what your tools are. Like uh, I have, um, you know, the magic keyboard from the on the iPad. They have a magic keyboard, and it is like I'm not joking. It is half the, the the thickness of my finger. It's so thin, and I can write like crazy on that. I can, you know, it's so easy to do twelve thousand words. It's so easy on a regular computer. I'd struggle to do five. It does depend, and I get no wow. wrist pain. I get no wrist pain with this. Okay. And yeah. So I, I have dodgy thumbs because of it, but, um, but yeah, so it does. Dodgy. Depend. I love that. She said dodgy. <laughs> yeah, that's quite true. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So this is kind of how many, how many WPNs can you do? Word per minute. Can you do? Have you tested? Because I'm super curious how you can get 25,000. If it's a well, day. I, right, okay, I can't tell you word per minute, but I can tell you in a sprint, in like 20 minutes, I think the max I've done in 20 minutes is 1,600 words. Wow. Yeah. So do, you, do like, you eat when you're on a deadline? Because, I mean. <laughs> I'm a pig. I'm a pig. <laughs> I have, like, ever since I, start, I became a full-time writer, 
elf my it's gone just like i'm trying to get it back and the you know the pandemic hasn't helped mm-hmm. and like yeah. working out it's such a chore and like you know, <laughs> health is so chore. and it's, it's really really hard but yeah so i i actually don't eat while i'm sprinting because i can't like you mm-hmm. you have to like switch up but it is tra- like seriously it's training anybody can do it yeah. it's just training you have to sit there and you cannot go on Facebook. You can't go on the internet. You can't do anything. You have to focus. Like I sprint with people. I don't know if you're or, or what you know writer sprintings are. It's where you you know write for twenty minutes, have a break for like ten minutes, maybe longer sometimes. So you try and get as many words out in those twenty minutes as you can. And uh, you know I'll I'll sprint with people, and afterwards I'll see that they were on Facebook as we were supposed to be writing. And <laughs> Oh, I only got 200 words. And I'm like, well, yeah, because you're on Facebook. <laughs> went on Facebook, not on the book. It's not, ma- it's not magic. It's literally just like right. you train for a marathon. You train for a 25,000 word day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's true. Yeah. It's not magic. And it's still helps to know like what you're writing too. So yeah. Oh, Oftentimes I'm when, a- I, when I'm writing slow, it's because I don't really know where my story is supposed to go next. So. Have you tried sprinting when you, mm-hmm. when you, when you don't know where it's going, it's amazing yep. how it comes out. Yep. Yeah, I'm a big fan I of haven't, I haven't sprinted, but you know what? My kids are in school now, and and I'm hopefully going to still be a, just a writer. Like, we'll see once things, you know, even after the move. So I'm thinking... But we do have a couple questions, and we were actually over time. So let me get to um, what, well, first off, De- Deborah, sorry, Deborah, what's your, what's your words per minute or how, what's your top <laughs> words a day? I'm, I'm very slow. I don't know my words, but I don't do more than 2000 a day. Sometimes yeah. I do three. I don't, I just, I do one book at a time. I have to write my scenes in order. Like I'm super anal that way. I can't jump from project to project. Uh, and I put out three to four books a year and that's it. Yeah. But that's, and, yeah. and that's what I've accepted about myself. It gets hard because it can, in the writer space, I mean, there are very fast writers and it can, mm-hmm. sometimes it can get really tough. Like, it's like, why aren't I doing more? Why? But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like, yeah. I can't put my eyes on other people. You know, I got to stay in my lane yeah. and this is what I can sustain. And this is what I can do to put out the books I want to do. So mm-hmm. yep. that's, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm learning to live with that. <laughs> now, well, it, we, though there's no shape that that is fantastic four books a year that is yeah fantastic. it you is know, say three but when you hear like you know people are putting out 40 right or oh. you know eight or 14 or it just you know it just it's just we always hear things right and then it's like oh why aren't i doing that or why you yeah. know you no know, what's interesting though is like i release a lot and sometimes i feel like i don't release enough i think it's there's a thing called like again for your audience i'm sure you know but there's the ku treadmill you know yep. keeping it real yep. off the top yep like you get onto this like path and you just can't get off it and then there are people who can release so many books and um the the, the, the answer is it's never enough you yeah. always feel like you never do enough <laughs> yep, yeah absolutely yep. but, yeah mm-hmm. well, and so, I think whatever somebody needs to do like your process is your process and yes. whether you release one book a year or one book every two years or yep. 50 books a year you know it's i think the writing is is such an individualized thing. Um, and some people, you know, I mean, they might write like one book a year and it just drains them and then they need three months to recover. And somebody else, you know, they might write three books at a time. And so it's yeah. super interesting to hear, you know, how people, what your process mm-hmm. is and, and how you work because I, I yeah. think it's such an individualized thing. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what are your favorite tropes to write? Is this both um, of you? For both of you. I'll let you go first, Abora. I love, well, I love enemies to lovers. And I have a lot of that. I mm-hmm. just adore writing that. <laughs> it's very fun. Yeah. I, I, I tend to not write. I, I don't feel like I write to tropes. You know, you have those moments where you're supposed to sit down and think about the tropes. Like, it's just very important. I have things that are really important to me. And it's like, I, it's so important that I have strong women. Yep. That. And then, I, and it's really important as well that I have men who back up that strength, mm-hmm. who aren't who aren't 
pressured by it or intimidated yeah. they you know they fight fire with fire sort of thing so mm -hmm. that's like the my underlying my own personal trope as it were um but i at the moment i really um i'm into teacher and uh teacher student <laughs> and then also uh historical you know that's a genre i know but like the historical like uh, the, the 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 duke and um the the duchess like their marriage has a problem i'm so i'm super yeah. oh, i love historical romance oh mm -hmm. not to write yeah. but to read it's my happy place <laughs> oh, i love reading historicals love it yeah lisa clay pass by the way oh yes yes that's a dare <sighs> oh yeah yes yeah and julia quinn i mean mm -hmm. yeah, yeah sarah mclean like oh yeah. just give me yeah. the books yeah very good ones yeah Have yeah said Bridgerton though, like I haven't read the Bridgerton series. I need to read that. Mm -hmm. Like I watched the series, I loved it. I loved it so much. I did no, but... too, and him. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm so I sad actually... he's gonna be in it. I know, I know. I don't blame him, but still, you know. I don't know. I, I got to sit next to Sarah during a, a book signing, so I was really oh cool excited to do that. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. All right, one more question, and then we because we are already like almost mm -hmm. uh, over Lucy's score time. Yeah, I'm and that's amazing. Um, and it was oh my gosh, I lost it. it was Karen's? Oh, what do you edit out of your last book? Last book? What did you edit out of it? Um, for myself, it was so the actual scene that I wrote. It was uh, where he sees her across a crowded room sort of thing and then uh it was from her perspective now my my books are very very intertwined so like one book from one series has like a connection to another book so uh in the previous in, a, in another book in another series you actually saw them meet for the first time so it was in this uh in the dawn we actually saw them meet and i cut out her part i cut out mm. her seeing him and just focused on him seeing her and uh, it made it a lot less like a lot less uh, internal dialogue that's why mm -hmm. i did that mm -hmm. i didn't edit anything out of my last book i it was so it was all my books are like very twisty turny mm -hmm. you know procedurals like whatever adventure they're on and this one was the most twisty turny one the one i had just finished and that's going to my proofer that it was it had to be very tightly plotted so I didn't, I expanded on stuff. I don't, I don't tend to cut out. I don't tend to overwrite first drafts. I tend to underwrite first drafts and then go in and dig deep and flesh it out. Mm -hmm. um, so my first drafts tend to start at like 72, 75,000 words. And then I'll like, you know, dig into character and theme more once I've got the basic structure down. So mm -hmm. there wasn't really anything edited out, I don't think. I write very similar to you. Similarly oh, to yeah? You. Yeah, it was just this particular occasion. Like I got, I got bored of them being so entranced with each other. I was like, okay, get on with it. Get on with being like, you know, I, I, you know, having eye sex sort of thing. And uh, but normally, I, I go in and I flesh out and stuff like that as well. I like to see the nitty gritty. But this, is the, it was a very good question. It's the first time I've ever done it. <laughs> That's why I have a lot of respect for people who write contemporary romance. I wrote, I wrote. I had a YA pen name and I wrote some contemporary romance under that name, but I love having magic. Cause I'm like, I could, mm -hmm. can't sustain. I, I need to, okay, here, let's just throw in a magic fight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, okay, good. <laughs> really paranormal is brilliant for that. Isn't it? You can just like, you can fix anything because it's yeah. a, who knows a spell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll solve the murder for you. <laughs> it's been so, I, 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 you know, it might so I write under Alexa Jade for paranormal. I just oh. started that pen name. And I feel like though writing with Alexa, it's more like a brain release. Like I'm not so like stressed and focused and like, like my brain isn't just like, so I don't know, like <laughs> with, with, with paranormal because I get to like create the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like my, it, it comes easier. It, it's a lot more fun to me, I think, writing. Reality is constraining, isn't it? Reality, yeah. you have to live within the bounds yeah. of reality. And that's, that's like, for me, that's really important. Like, I don't, I, you know, I write Mafia and MC. Somebody has to go to prison at some point. Somebody <laughs> has to. You cannot have yeah. these guys who go around killing people. And they're yeah. like, you know, like mm -hmm. I, and, or, and if you don't go to prison, there has to be a reason because they know somebody. But like in the normal world, oh. I love I love writing paranormal. That's my yeah. happy. That's one, that's one of my I mean, all you got to do is if your person's about to go to 
prison or you know get killed or what if you just got to throw in some magic and then it fixes everything so <laughs> that said though i spend the longest on my world building before a series like i can spend yeah. several months figuring out the magic systems and the rules of the world and the you know and and feeling like i'm dancing around until some one day it just it'll snap into place and it's like okay now i can start figuring out the plot of book one do you mm -hmm. use the bible as a base for that um, I draw from the Old Testament, yeah, and then folk, Jewish folklore, and then just everything else I've ever read or internalized from, you know, fairy tales. Like in the Unlikable Demon Hunter books, the demons, they just, they came from all over. I had like books about demons in different cultures that I would reference, and, and then I just made up mm -hmm. some that I needed specifically for my own purposes, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I think paranormal fascinates me. I, I haven't mm -hmm. tried paranormal. But it's fun. But yeah. yeah. I love it. So, well, thank you for being with us. We've gone way over. We try to keep it to around yes. an hour. We, we never, ever, ever do, but I think this might be our longest episode ever. So <laughs> thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you for coming. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And you want to tell people where they can find you, Deborah, where can readers find you if they want to check out more of your books? Uh, you can find me on Amazon at Deborah Wild. You can find me at www.deborahwild.com, uh, my Facebook page, or I have a readers group on Facebook, Deborah's Wild Ones, that you can find me at, and it's a great group. That's where I'm. That's my happy place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, you can find me on Amazon. I only write in KU, so mm -hmm. I'm on Amazon and SerenaAcroyd.com, and from, I also have a Facebook reader group, and it's called Serena Acroyd's Divas. And as you can imagine, we're divas in there. <laughs> so all is welcome. All are welcome, should I say? Fantastic. And you both have a giveaway. We will keep that open until Sunday night. So if you haven't been over to the Romance Happy Hour Facebook page yet, um, it's the pinned post at the top. And um, Deborah is giving away two Kindle copies of Throwing Shade. And Serena is giving away um, paperbacks. And your giveaway is open internationally. That's always a bonus. Uh, Sometimes our, our international viewers feel so left out because it's so expensive to ship internationally. So, yeah. so if you're international, make sure you get in and, and enter that. We'll leave those both open until Sunday night. So, well, thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Dawn, yes. so much. It was lonely without you, Dawn. We're glad you're back too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm and glad I'm back. <laughs> You you made it to this late hour and you're not falling asleep. So oh, it's only eight twenty. I was like, maybe yeah, I right? can put my kids' bunk beds together after this, but then I thought, no, they got school somewhere else. So yeah, don't don't get too <laughs> <laughs> don't get too aggressive there. <laughs> All right, well, we will see you um, next episode is yes. the second Tuesday in September. So we'll see you then. We hope you come back then. And again, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank so. you. All right, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.